Hi everybody and thank you for your patience. You are joining us on our second match day live of, um, of uh, Thursday. The first one this morning is now recorded up on our website with Rusty Oglesby talking about high school soccer. Absolutely fascinating conversation. It ran for half an hour. Really encourage you to check that out. Um, we've also put a poll question up uh, for this presentation. Um, so hopefully you can see that publishing now. And you can decide if you want to answer that question now or you'd like to answer it at the end of this 15 to 20 minutes with our guest. Our guest is uh, Tess Supranop from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And she is in charge of both the business school career services and the general college. And it's um, actually a really interesting time for Tess because she's getting more business from her students who are happy dealing in the digital world or virtual world they're less inclined to come in in person. So Tess is quite happy working from home with more work than, uh, than less. What we'd like to do uh, for about 15, 20 minutes is guide you through some uh, cover or well, resume and perhaps cover letter next time, um, one-on-ones basics um, that will, should help us at this time as we start thinking about that. What we see here is an opportunity with some more time at home to actually start refreshing some of our resume cover letters. This isn't really meant to be a panic situation, more of a challenge to take on some new content. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Tess to say hello and thank her for her time. Uh, Tess, I'm gonna ask you questions as you go through your presentation, but if you wanna go to screen share, please go ahead. Sure. Fabulous. Yeah, I'll bring up my slides. Just be patient with me while I while I do that. Maybe Maybe I won't. Um, application window. Nope, that's and those not. of you that are joining us, if you feel uh, this is a useful presentation, please share it amongst your club and colleagues, um, because this information could actually pertain to your high school kids and your college players uh, with other types of resumes they might be writing. All right, I'm uh, I'm having some difficulties. Hold on, just a second. Um, Test, would you like me to share my screen and then we'll do it my way? Um, maybe so. Oh, wait. I, let me just. I'm, I'm, I'm so used to Zoom um, and this is a different platform. I'm, I'm sorry. I am having a application window. There we go. Magic. There you go. Let's see if I can. All right, Perfect. can you see this? We can see it perfectly. It's our beautiful building where I am not currently. So, um, but I, I thought I'd give some quick tips on resumes for specifically for soccer coaches. I've done a fair amount of work with soccer coaches over the last several years. I teach for one of the DOC courses offered by United Soccer Coaches and uh, one of our our career advancement segments is always popular part of that section or that course. So um, I have five quick tips um, and feel free to ask questions throughout, Ian. Okay. So my first tip for resumes is keep it brief. And, you know, so often I see resumes that are two, three, four, five, seven pages long. And really one page is what you need for um, if you're early in your career. So if you've been working somewhere between five to seven years in your profession or less, um, then, then it really should be one page. And then once you get to that sort of five to seven range, um, then you can start moving to two pages. But uh, in general, you just want to keep it brief and don't go over two pages. And the, uh, the, the way to think about it is, you're not really giving the history of your entire professional career. You're just you're just using this as a marketing document to highlight the key points of your your professional history that make you qualified for the job that you're applying for. And so, you, you know, as time goes on, some of your older stuff you either can take off your resume or you can condense it down a little bit because usually it's the most recent that is the most relevant. So that's my number one tip. And Tess, number two, so yeah. what about font size? What should be the font size on a resume? Because I could make the font really small and get it on one page. 
No, so so really a size 10 font is about the smallest you should go. Otherwise it starts looking like so much heavy text on a resume. And also try and keep your margins. I wouldn't go any narrower than three quarters of an inch all the way around. Again, if you, if you start bringing your margins so that it's so narrow, like a half an inch or a quarter of an inch, it just looks like so much text and nobody wants to read that. And it just becomes a bit intimidating to look at. So for a gray beard like myself or Vince, who've been coaching since the mid eighties, still one page, two page for us. I would say for you guys, you get two pages because I, I know you have great experience, but I would keep it to two pages. Now, every once in a while, you might be in a situation where somebody with your level of experience could go three pages, but but try not to. Really, nobody wants to read three pages. Um, so just find a way to, to talk about what your experience is within two pages. And, you know, the simple fact is so much of your older experience either has been repeated by jobs that you've had since, or you don't need to list quite as much detail with those, those early experiences. Okay, thank you. 100% error free. Really, seriously, people, it has to be error free. And, and this is a lot. This, you know, so often I, I laugh because I'll get resumes to review. And at some point in the resume, they'll say that they're attentive to details. And yet then they'll have errors all the way through. So it really needs to be error free. And it needs to be error free in terms of spelling and typos and punctuation, but also in terms of the formatting. I have an example here that I want to share with you. I found this online and I think I've redacted anything that might identify who the person is. And I have no idea who they are. It just, I found it online. It's not me. Um, what's that? It's not me. <laughs> That's good. Um, so there's so many errors here. It's, it's almost comical. Um, so you start out, there's an objective statement and I don't like objective statements in general. It's a pretty 1990s sort of thing. We don't see it very much anymore. Um, your objective is to get the job that you're applying to. They know what job you're applying to. So it just takes up space. But I love this one because their objective wasn't even to obtain a position. It was just to seek for a position. So, um, but then, um, if you look under education, their formatting was different with each of their universities. So, um, at their most recent, which is redacted, uh, they, they had it formatted one way and then down below their previous university or college experience was bulleted. So it's a completely different formatting structure, which just seems jarring. And you can see intern experience is misspelled. Um, and under intern exper experience, they forgot to name uh, the name of the organization, where it was located, um, what their job title was. Um, so lots and lots of errors there. And then just little things down below, uh, when they're talking about some of their player experience, they talk about an academy, soccer, and then club should also be capitalized. Another error is really on your resume, you would never want to include any sort of references and their, their contact information. And so part of what I redacted here was this person had listed all of their coaches by name and, and really that sort of information would go on a reference sheet, which would be a completely separate document. Would the reference sheet be provided with a resume or is that upon request? Upon request. And, and think of it, this is somebody's private information. And so you don't want to be giving out somebody's email and telephone number, cell phone number to, to anybody you would be applying to. You really want to save that for when they're ready to do a reference check. They'll ask you for it. And that's the time when you should hand over that information. Okay. I've got a quick question. What font is this or what is your preferred font? This is a Times New Roman font. And... Um, Oh, test froze out there for a second. This one, uh, they, you know, on, on Word documents, you can choose how the, the margins line up either on the left side, so justified on the left side, justified on the right side, or you can do it so it's block text. 
and justified on both sides. So this one is, is using both, which causes this really weird spacing. So some of the L's get scrunched together, um, but then there's some big gaps between. So don't do that in your own resume. Uh, use just the, the left justified option. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Barker? No, let's keep going. All right. So third thing, no gimmicks. No gimmicks in terms of adding color, adding photos, adding infographics. It, it, one of the big things is that it doesn't actually upload into applicant tracking systems very well. And these are the systems that larger organizations tend to use to manage all of the applicants. And so when you add those color elements and those graphic elements, it tends to come up as garbled, and then the system can't read your resume very well. I'll show you some examples. Yeah, if I could so, just inter interrupt there, that's really interesting because increasingly college jobs, high school jobs, bigger club jobs, and we, uh, myself and Vince, do a lot of um, helping people with their applications for universities, and you're uploading documents into their system and they require a certain format. And so exactly. these types of things wouldn't work on a, on a bigger type job. Right, exactly. And so I work at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and our HR department uses applicant tracking systems that, that don't read these examples of resumes very well. And so when it's converting it to a plain text document, any color, any graphic element really just comes up as this garble of symbols, which then makes a real mess of your resume. And, and sometimes if they can't read your resume at all, it'll just, the system sort of boots you out as a, as a not adequate uh, okay. applicant. The other problems, even if, even if you're thinking, well, the organization I'm applying to doesn't use an applicant tracking system. I'm sending this to a human being and they're going to review it. If you look at the, the green and black example of a resume, part of the problem with this sort of more interesting looking resume is that it's a really bad utilization of space and it's hard to find the information. So most people are used to seeing the, the name and the contact information at the top of the document. And so in this document, the contact information is in the middle. It's, it's not where I expect it to be. If you look at the career summary part of it, because of the, the formatting on this and because so much space has been given over to the graphic elements, there's not really much room for you to talk about your work experience. And, and so for, if this is being compared to somebody who's really fleshed out what they've done and what they've accomplished in their positions, then this person isn't even coming close. Um, so, so it looks interesting, but it's just not very effective. The, um, the one uh, on the right is one of the templates, right? And you're not very big on wizards and templates. No, and I'm not big on wizards and templates for a couple reasons. Oftentimes their, their goal is to make it look more interesting, not necessarily make it look like what the recruiter or the hiring manager wants it to look like. So that's one issue. The other issue is they are really hard to edit. Uh, anyone who's ever used one of these knows that you're, you're kind of limited by these boxes that you can put the text in. And so when you try and change that or add to it or move things around, um, it just becomes a nightmare. So just use a plain old simple Word document and use the most basic of elements like bolding and italics uh, to, to do the, the sort of flair. Um, uh, and I'll show you an example of, of what would be really considered by almost all organizations as a really well done resume. And I'll show you that in just a second. Any other questions, Ian? No, we're good. Um, we've got some people admitting. Uh, we've got one person who admits that their resume is perfect, uh, several that um, think it's about 50-50, and a couple that say not so much. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll try to speak to that audience as we go through here. 
So I did a survey of uh, several hundred recruiters and hiring managers that I used to work with. And uh, the, the consensus of that group was that about 80% of the resumes that they reviewed, they categorized as abysmal and, <laughs> and an embarrassment to the person who sent them. So, so statistically speaking, 80% are probably really, really bad. And what they also reported was only about two or 3% of the resumes that they saw, they thought were great. And yeah. so there was a little bit, maybe about 18% that, that were adequate. Okay. So the, the fourth tip I have is that you really need to tailor your job for your resume for every job these days. Uh, gone are the days where you have one resume, you print out a bunch of copies of it, and you send that in for every job. Uh, it just won't work anymore. It won't work with the applicant tracking systems that are looking for keywords and phrases and specific experience levels for the, the specific job that you're applying to. Um, and really, even if it's being reviewed by a human being, there is an expectation that you're applying for their job specifically, and they want to see how you're qualified for that specific job. And so it really is important to include a lot more detail. And, and I know it seems like it's a lot of work, like I have to rewrite my resume for every job. It's not necessarily rewriting it for every job, but it might be restructuring it. It might be changing a few bullet points here and there. It might be changing some of the words uh, to better fit what the, what the job description is asking for. I have an example for that too. So Jane Doe here is a, is a person I had worked with a few years ago. And, and on the, the left-hand side, you can see her original resume, which is actually not horrible or anything. It's, it's pretty, pretty neat and tidy and well laid out and consistent. And she's got great experience. And she was applying for a head coaching job at a D1 school. And in our conversation, I found out that actually the school was her, her alma mater. So I thought, well, okay, you know, up at the career summary, let's get rid of the objective, but at, let's add a career summary that, that really highlights right at the top of her resume that, that she's an alum of that, of that program. And, and then for, for her work experience, we customized the, the headers so that she has a whole category that's division one coaching experience because she's applying for a division one coaching job. So really highlight that you've got a whole section worth of experience in D1. And, and then when you look at her most recent job at Omega University, um, which of course is a made up name, um, the, the subheaders within that, the coaching and player development, recruiting and leadership and administration, those are the exact subheaders that the job description had used when they were outlining what were the specific qualities that they were looking for. And by replicating that, that's the type of customization I'm talking about, is that she was really able to show that, that she was a great fit, that within each of the, the main points that they were looking for, she had great experience. And then within each of those areas, each of the bulleted items, it talks more about her achievement and what she did rather than just merely listing tasks. And, and really that's what's going to set your resume apart is rather than just saying, you know, if you're applying for a job at, at a youth club, rather than saying, you know, that club's organization name and the dates you worked there and that you were a coach and having a bullet coached, you know, U9 girls. Well, that doesn't really say a whole lot. And it doesn't really give the, the, the person reviewing the resume any sense of, are you good at working with parents? Do you have any experience doing fundraising? What did that look like? How successful was it? Um, do you do you are you uh, committed to to making sure that the the uh, practices are appropriate for that age group? Um, do you keep up with your training? So so giving that level of detail, which is the 
the type of information that they're saying in their job description typically that they're looking for, but most people don't put that on their resume. And, and so somehow they assume that the person who's reviewing the resume will know that not only do they have that experience, but that they were good at it. Okay, so and, Tess, to interrupt, yeah. sorry, because I would like to honor people's time, but this is fascinating. We probably need more of this and, and cover letters too. A couple of things. I, I really like the idea that on the second uh, resume here, we actually read the words that were in the job description and have sort of parroted them back to the employer. So if they had asked for coaching, plan development, recruiting, leadership, and admin, you actually mimic those words back at them, correct? Right, exactly. And then make action, it really easy for them to connect the dots that what they're looking for is what you have. Yeah, and then action verbs, strong words like what would be what would be an example of a passive and a and a stronger verb? Assist. Um, um, oftentimes manage, if you're talking about managing people, um, that can be an okay word. But if you're talking about managing a project, it would be better to talk about the specific elements of the project that you are responsible for. Um, but oftentimes I'll see assisted, which is a very weak and passive okay. and, and doesn't give any sort of indication of what the work was actually. Um, we have a question from a gentleman called Paul, but I've got his email address because it might be a bit bit much for this presentation. Um, he's going to be applying for a secondary teaching job with coaching as something that hopefully would, would make him more desirable. So if it's okay with you and Paul, I'm going to save his email and you can just drop him back a couple of notes. Is that good? Yeah, fabulous. That'd be great. I'd love to. Okay. Your final point five. Okay, so my, my point five is actually, as typical, I'm saving the best for last. So my, my final bit of resume advice, oh, um, before I get there though, if you need some help in tailoring your resume to the job that you're applying to, this site, jobscan.com, can really help you with that. You upload your resume, you cut and paste the job description, and it tells you how good a match you your resume is for the job. So. Go use that. I love it. But my last bit of advice, my best advice for resumes is network. And, and <laughs> yours is such a tight knit industry where people know each other. The best way to get your resume looked at, the best way to be guaranteed an, inter, um, an interview is to know somebody within the organization or know somebody who, who knows somebody there who's, who will put in a good word for you. Um, networking it's far and away you could even have a pretty bad resume but if you're doing a really good job of networking you can still get a, an interview and and it's that's what you need you need the interview so so build those networks you know, if you've taken any any courses through united soccer coaches you've probably met a number of different instructors through that you've met other uh, attendees of the courses who can be part of your network, the people that you work with in your job, um, past co colleagues and coworkers, people you might meet at the convention. Uh, this is such a great organ uh, industry because, because there are so many great ways to meet people and expand your network, but, but it's also the best way to find that next new job. Okay, we have, um, we have another question from Robert. Um, which is about where to place his educational history. And, and I'll take his email down because of, in the interest of time. In terms of the networking, just a couple of insights from my point and, and Vince's. I've been coaching in America since 1987, and I can count the negative, I would really negative interactions in the soccer community in less than five. And so you do kind of stay connected to everybody, and especially at a time like this where this is an opportunity to stay connected, and we may need those connections down the line. I also sort of have this image of 50 resumes for a job, and I'm looking to push as many of those 50 to one side to discount them and have a much smaller group to really go through. And reasons that I will get to that smaller group would be absolutely ne um, networking and recommendations. And another reason to push them to the other side would be typos or misspelling. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'd love to work at the University of Wisconsin, and in conclusion, it'd be great to be a Wolverine. Well, you cut and paste it because Wisconsin are the Badgers, the Wolverines of Michigan, that kind of stuff. Um, 
But this test, this, exactly. was, this was excellent. Um, Vince, you got any quick questions for Tess before we let her go? No, no, no quick questions. I do hope that your other half makes you a wonderful dinner tonight for your time. And uh, again, thank you so much. It was really, really uh, fantastic information. And those that are on the webinar listening and, and ask the chats, uh, ask the questions through chat, you can email me or Ian and we'll get the question to Tess and she'll get, I know that, you know, she'll get back to us. So yeah, I have Robert and Paul's emails and Chris, you had a Great. question. You can see we've put Tess's Gmail up there. Um, they're not going to be war and peace responses, but hopefully there'll be a couple of lines that will help you guys. Um, and if, if this was an interesting topic and you're interested in hearing it again, cover letters as well about how to write an effective cover letter to go with your resume. Uh, let Vince and I know. But um, Tess, thank you very much. I'll My pleasure. For, I'll probably see you for dinner. How is it upstairs? <laughs> it's lovely here. It's great down here in the lounge, so that's good. All right. Thank oh, you, guys. Great. Really appreciate it. All right. <laughs> see, you, see some people tomorrow. Thanks, Tess. Thank you. All right.